The ongoing titanic struggle between the bond market and the Federal Reserve has really heated up here, unlike inflation or the real economy. The Fed has just stepped up its efforts by a full notch. We got confirmation yesterday of sorts in the FOMC minutes that were released for the meeting from last month, the pause meeting. And this is something that policymakers have been sort of hinting at and pointing toward in the weeks leading up to the meeting minutes re release. What am I talking about? Well, let's start by going over the minutes and what they actually said. This is from the text. The economic forecast prepared by the staff for the June FOMC meeting continue to assume that the effects of the expected further tightening in bank credit conditions amid already tight financial conditions would lead to a mild recession starting later this year, followed by a moderately paced recovery. Real GDP was projected to decelerate in the current quarter and the next one before declining modestly in both the fourth quarter of this year and first quarter of next year. So like the marketplace, the Federal Reserve's models, they expect a mild recession to happen at some point beginning this year. But here's the thing. Almost all participants noted that in their economic projections, they judged that additional increases in the target federal funds rate during 2023 would be appropriate. Do you see what they're doing here? They're saying that we're going to have a recession that begins this year. We're already saying, we're already forecasting a recession. Yet at the same time, we're also going to be hiking rates. It's not as if we're uncertain about a recession. That's now the baseline case, and we're going to hike rates anyway. This is a new form of operation twist, and one that works entirely through forward guidance. And the point of it here is to twist the yield curve, because now the Fed has raised the bar on rate cuts that the market has been expecting for a long time. The Fed pivot. That's the battle. The, the market has said Fed pivot because there's going to be a recession. And the Fed just took it up a notch by saying, we see the recession and we're not going to pivot. Not only we're not going to pivot, we're going to continue hiking rates even though we expect a recession, a mild recession. So what is actually going on here? Why is the Fed so intent on twisting the yield curve and using forward guidance to do so? Well, that's what we're going to get into here today. We're going to talk about what Operation Twist was supposed to be, what it really means, how the Fed intends to accomplish it, why it intends to accomplish it, and what the current labor market data that we just got today says about all of these things. But first, I'm Jeff. This is Eurodollar University. Thank you very much for joining me. If you're interested, Eurodollar University has memberships available, exclusive content about the Eurodollar system, the monetary system, what it is, what it's supposed to do, how it works, when it's supposed to work, and why maybe it isn't working regardless of what the Fed does or says. We also have research subscriptions available. I contribute a daily briefing of the, the day's top macro and money news at marketsinsiderpro.com. And I also do a daily deep dive where we dive deep into all of these things, money and macro, and usually where money and macro come together, what that means about what's going on today and how that's going to imp impact us all tomorrow. All the information, memberships and research subscriptions, eurodollar.university. There was an article in Bloomberg printed just yesterday, which I think sets the stage for what we're talking about here. The, the, um, the struggle between the bond market and the Fed and its econometric models and its understanding of its Phillips curve understanding of inflation. This is again from yesterday from Bloomberg. Some of the biggest bond managers are sticking to their bullish view on the market for U.S. government debt, even as that trade looks riskier by the day, if you believe the Federal Reserve. Brandywine Global Investment Management, Columbia Threadneedle Investments, and Vanguard Group are keeping the faith that a rousing fixed income rally is coming, a stance that is being sorely tested by the economy's resilience and the Federal Reserve's eyeing of higher interest rates. Maybe they're betting that the economy isn't resilient and that eventually the Federal Reserve will have to recognize that resilience by cutting rates that are already going to be going lower anyway. Because let's face it, if we have another banking crisis or another stage of the banking crisis, which is probably inevitable here, we're going to see the same things that we saw during the first stage of the banking crisis just a couple months ago. Rates plummeted all over the curve. Now, why would the Federal Reserve be 
angered and upset and willing to do another Operation Twist for something like that. We'll start by talking about what Operation Twist was in the original sense. And that means we have to go back to 2011. We're not going to go back to the original Operation Twist, which was way back many, many, many decades ago. The Operation Twist that they came up with in September of 2011. If you remember 2011, it sounds a lot like today. We had a supply shock that spiked consumer prices around the world, but then the supply shock ended and a banking crisis had erupted around the same time, which led bond yields to decline and the economy to start to really weaken in the United States and in Europe, it went into recession. Emerging markets got hit a little bit. So the global economy was in a bad place. So was the Federal Reserve because it was desperately trying to figure out where this banking crisis was coming from. They had no idea. First of all, they had no idea because they had just completed QE2. QE2 was just finished, so they, they decided in September 2011, faced with all of these negative pressures all over the place, including the end of the supply shock, banking crisis, weak economy, all that stuff, they couldn't just start another QE so soon after ending the second one because that would be admitting QE doesn't work, which is probably what they should have done and saved us all the trouble. But instead, they said, well, let's come up with this operation twist. And the idea here would be to sell short-term government bonds and use the proceeds to buy longer-term government bonds. In doing so, selling short-term government bonds, it would raise, theoretically raise, short-term rates at the same time as buying long-term government bonds would lower long-term government bond yields, thereby twisting the curve. And the idea was that in lowering long-term rates, that would be, that would theoretically be stimulus in the real economy because that's where this credit idea of stimulus comes from, this interest rate idea of stimulus. It's not about short-term money rates. It's about long-term credit rates, interest rates on longer-term debt that becomes the, the borrowing that you and I and businesses around the economy actually do. So by twisting the curve and pushing rates down at the longer end, that would, that would, uh, that would create accommodation and easing of credit in the real economy at a particularly inopportune moment, a moment for, the, for everybody, including the Federal Reserve, because of what was happening all over the place. So lower, longer term rates, accommodation and easing. And they cloaked it in this Operation Twist um, mechanism simply because they didn't want to admit QE2 failed and they didn't want to say we're going to do another QE so soon after the other one. But this raised a whole bunch of questions, and I hope I think you've you've probably already noted the inconsistency here from what I just said earlier describing the situation. Bond yields had already tumbled. They had tumbled earlier in 2011, so that we got to by the time we get to September 2011, rates were down substantially, not just in the U.S. or U.S. Treasuries, but around the world, which caused Richard Fisher, former Dallas Fed President Richard Fisher, of all people. To wonder aloud, this is from the FOMC transcript from September 2011, when the Federal Reserve was debating Operation Twist. This is what Fisher said. In summary, I want to mention that, as I said earlier, most of these variations that have been suggested are very unbadget like referring to Walter Badgett, the former Bank of England governor and really the guy who wrote the book on central banking. And what I mean by that is twisting entails purchasing assets that investors are fleeing toward not assets they are fleeing from. So what he was saying is, why are we trying to lower long-term interest rates? Because the market has already lowered them. And the answer was the Fed didn't know what else to do. They couldn't do another QE, which raised the level of bank reserves because that would be admitting the former QE didn't work, which would mean the next QE wouldn't work. If you admit QE doesn't work, you can't do another QE and expect it to work because all of this is about psychology not actual markets. The markets were telling you exactly what was going on, which was deflationary circumstances, recession, all of that in yields going lower. But policymakers and academic economists believe that lower rates are stimulus. That's where the struggle really comes from. The market recognizes like Newt Wicksell and Ben Bernanke, the former, former scholar at MIT, and Milton Friedman, Lower interest rates are not stimulus. They're consistent with a tight money and depression economics. But the Fed believes the opposite. 
So that brings us to 2020, actually 2021, 22, and 23. Ever since the Federal Reserve decided that it was no longer going to believe inflation was transitory, the bond market and the Fed and its rate hikes have been at, uh, at odds. The bond market has been resisting the Fed's rate hikes all along. That's what inversion really means. The Fed is saying we want rates to go up and the bond market is saying rates are going to go down because they need to go down. We're still in what Newt Wixell described as depression economics. But understanding what we just talked about with Operation Twist, as well as what the inversion meant in terms of long-term yields, if longer term yields are accommodative and the Federal Reserve not understanding actual inflation believes that a tight labor market or really that what they believe is expectations create inflation, then they can't have lower long term rates because lower long term rates might signal accommodation, therefore making this expectation inflation crisis in the Federal Reserve's view that much worse. So the more the bond market prices recession and deflation, the lower long-term rates go, the more it angers the Federal Reserve because those longer, lower longer-term rates are fighting against the thing that the Federal Reserve wants to accomplish by raising rates. And over the last several months, the Fed has, tried, has, has adopted a few tactics to try to get long-term rates to do what the Fed wants it to do. They want rates to go up. We think back to the forward guidance that it was using and giving out in, say, February and March before the banking crisis hit. Higher for longer. Using forward guidance to try to twist the curve so that the curve would respond so that long-term rates go up and stop being so accommodative in the Fed's model. But that's not what bond markets are about. Lower long-term yields, again, not about accommodation. That's about recession. So the more that there's going to be a recession, the lower rates want to go. So if you're the Federal Reserve and you want rates to go up and you say recession, then rates are going to want to go down. So how do you twist the curve in that situation? This brings us to this new tactics, this new forward guidance twist, where the Federal Reserve is now saying the bar for cutting rates of policy rates is that much higher now because we intend on hiking rates during a recession. It is completely undercutting, or at least what it thinks it's doing. The Fed is completely undercutting the bond market's rate cut rationale because they're saying we don't care about a mild recession. Rates are going to go up. So if the Fed, if the bond market is thinking recession, lower rates, the Fed just took that argument completely away. And the idea is to manipulate not the entire curve because the Fed realizes it can't, Instead, it's only trying to influence short and really medium term rates like the two year treasury, which it does, it, it does have the ability to influence. And so if you own a two year treasury and here's the Fed saying, I'm going to hike rates even in a recession, you have to think, well, maybe repo rates and other alternative, uh, other alternative investment rates, they are going to be higher for longer because the bar for cutting rates of the, the Fed's benchmark rates is that much higher. And so as the two-year rate is brought up on the expectations of short-term policy rates and other short-term money rates, it has the same sort of effect, not a one-to-one, of raising and pulling longer-term treasury yields up too. That's why we see the 10-year, the seven-year, and that part of the curve go up as well. The Fed is attempting to twist the yield curve higher using this forward guidance version of, of reverse operation twist. Not really doing anything at the short end that they're not already doing, but really trying to manipulate the bond market to get yields to go up because they believe that consumer prices are not yet under control, that the market disagrees about. Again, this is not about accommodation in the marketplace. It's about the fact we're facing a recession that's likely to be nasty. So the Fed is looking at the world one way and thinking rates need to go up. The bond market is looking at the world a very different way and saying rates are going to go down and it's not about the Fed cutting rates. And there's the titanic struggle. The Fed took things up a notch by trying this new forward guidance. We're going to hike into a recession forward guidance. Now, what does the actual data say? Well, I went over yesterday what producer price data says about inflation and consumer prices through the perspective of producer prices, which you should pay attention to instead of core consumer prices, because core consumer prices don't tell you anything 
about the situation in the economy or the situation in the economy coming up. Producer prices are predictive. Consumer prices are exceptionally lagging. But what about the Phillips curve? Because the Fed always talks about the Phillips curve and brings up the tight labor market as the reason why they want rates to be unaccommodative. Why do rates need to go up in their theory? Because of the labor market. The job openings number, which is always the most optimistic take of the economy and labor market, that one tumbled to 9.82 million, down from an upward revised 10.32 million in April. These are main numbers for jolts. That's just above the recent low in March. So even the most optimistic number for um, labor demand in the economy, that hasn't that, that's down substantially from where it was, was last year. And yes, the absolute level of job openings is still ridiculously high, but that's just the fact that Jolts is overstating labor demand anyway. So if the one that overstates labor demand is falling and, and getting weaker, maybe there's something to it. The real number, though, in Jolts is usually the hiring number. The hires number ticked up a little bit to 6.21 million in May from 6.1 million in April, but that's still down. Ever since January and February, we're, we're below 6.3 million, and you can see how the hiring rate is continuing to get slowly and slowly and slowly weaker to the point where it's now in the same range it had been in, say, 2019 when the economy looked like it was heading into recession then. But looking under the hood, the real number in jolts, I think, is professional and business services, hiring in that those industries, which includes temp workers, highly cyclical. The, the hiring in professional business services fell to 1.07 million from 1.21 million. There was a slight rebound in April into uh, March into April and then a big drop off in May. That's the lowest since May of 2020. And that really outside of 2020, you got to go back to December 2017 for that low of a number, which suggests that hiring in a highly cyclical industry, one that I've brought up before in the payroll reports, temp, temp workers in particular, the labor market is getting weaker, not stronger. Maybe what lower long term bond yields are reflecting, not what the Fed wants it to reflect in some form of Phillips curve. So the labor market data. I think is it's more and more looking like the pricing data that we've, got, or we've already got, not as much like what the Federal Reserve wants it to look like or what the Federal Reserve believes it looks like in terms of an inflationary economy. But because the Fed is so focused on the core consumer price rate and the unemployment rate together, it believes that rates want to go up. So it is fighting against the long-term, in the bond market long-term rates, trying to get them up and it just raised its ante a little bit more by saying, we're going to raise our rates even though we agree there's a recession. So not that part, the bond market and the Fed agree there's going to be a recession, but they still disagree about what that means or even really what that recession looks like. I'm Jeff. This is Eurodollar University. Thank you very much for joining me. As always, huge thank you. Eurodollar University research subscribers, Markets Insider Pro research subscribers, and of course, Eurodollar University members, all of you a sincere thank you. Until next time, take care.